All right. It comes from the book of Romans. We're going to read uh, chapter 11, verses 33 through 36, and then chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Now, I, I need to say something about this. When we read this, uh, this was a letter written by a guy named Paul to a church in well, Rome. So when you read through this, it's not like a book that has chapters and verses. So because they're two different chapters, it, it, it's a still a complete thought. We just broke them up so that we could figure out how to read the Bible better. All right. But, but this is one complete thought. So let's, let, me, let me give that to you guys. So same thought. Here is Paul. In, verse, uh, in chapter 11, verses uh, 33 through 36. Have you ever come on anything quite like this extravagant generosity of God? This deep, deep wisdom. It's way over our heads. We'll never figure it out. Is there anyone around who can explain God? Anyone smart enough to tell him what to do? Anyone who has done him such a huge favor that God has to ask his advice? Everything comes from him. Everything happens through him. Everything ends up in him. Always glory. Always praise. Yes, yes, yes. And then in chapter 12, he completes this thought. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work, your walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you. Develops a well-formed maturity in you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So again, when we come up against struggle in this world, when things uh, can't be controlled, the moments um, where we're out and out realize that I, I just cannot deal with this and we see how small we are, we have two options. We can shut down, we can take our ball and go home, we can blame God and blame other people. We say over and over again that the world isn't fair. Or, we can lean into the fact that we are not in control, we can be in awe of God, and our response can be that we choose to worship, even in the midst of chaos. That's what I want to talk about in worship today, is what worship is, and that is turning moments of mystery and amazement and brokenness into moments of awe and giving glory to God. So then the question is, if we do choose worship in these midst of awe, in these midst of O, that brings up the question, what is worship really? What does it look like? How do we do it? So what I want to do today is I want to describe what worship is and then give you at the end some practical things that you can do in your day-to-day -day life to try to find that, that awe moment, that oh, in the midst of your week. So let's begin with these questions because these are the questions that I get most often. All right, um, Why do we worship God in the first place? Does God need our worship? Uh, does God need us to tell him how great he is? Anybody ever heard of Bill Maher? Okay, great. Bill Maher, he's the guy who uh, uh, did that documentary, uh, Religionless. Anyway, he is, uh, he is a, an atheist, and um, he said that God must be the most egotistical being ever to create something just so that he can be worshipped. Now, is that what God wants? Is that what God needs? It, is worship that? You know, we hear stories of the ancient Israelites sacrificing goats and sheep and doves and all sorts of other animals uh, for God. Every Near Eastern culture does that. So, so does God require that kind of sacrifice on a weekly basis? What about music? 
that way. <laughs> what kind of singing does God like? Does God prefer just the older hymns? Uh, or does God like three power chords and some truth mixed in? You know, is, it, is, that, is that what God prefers? Um, it might not be a big deal in Compass, but 20 years ago, this was a huge argument in church. You know, no, God only likes the organ. Okay. The organ is, in, in the life of the church is still is, is relative, uh, relatively new. Um, you know, did Jesus have a pipe organ? That's my question. Uh, he says, no, no, no. Get out of the synagogue. There's no organ in here. We can't worship today. Um, what about language? What language does God speak? Does God only speak in Hebrew? In Greek? In Latin? <laughs> Something in American, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> that's the language. That's the language of God. I I prefer to think that God speaks in jive. You remember my airplane? He's like, <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All of these are important questions about what does God require? What does God want from us? Right. And so let me let me let me answer that this way. Um, you guys have heard of this man named David, right? He was king in uh, Jerusalem and, and wrote a bunch of songs for God. We call them psalms. All right, this is Psalm 51. This is 16 through 7. And I love this because he answers this question. He's talking to God and he says, You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offering. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit broken and contrite heart. This God did not despise. So in a time when people are really, really focused on uh, the form of worship, which, uh, which sacrifice for sin to make, right? This is when David is writing. Uh, he says, make sh uh, they, they basically say, make sure you have the right animal for the right sin, right? You know, it's like, you, know, you have to fill out reports in order to worship. You know, do you have your TPS reports filled out? No. Well, you can't come into worship. Um, and, and this is what they would do. They would cross the keys and dot the eyes and make sure that they were making the right sacrifices. And David says, yeah, no, not about that. It's about being broken and vulnerable before God. It's about being clear of all pretense and just having a clean <laughs> sanctuary for God to live within us. Let me say it another way. We've, we've been given this picture of worship that says if we just sing loud enough, if we just say the right prayers, if we read the right scripture, when we're supposed to read the scripture according to the lectionary, then we can change God. We can make God happy through our worship. Um, and I don't think that is what worship is. I don't think worship changes God. What I think worship does is that it changes us. My heart, my soul is the thing that is being changed in all of this. Moving towards the sense of, oh, changes us. It doesn't change God. And I think God was trying to show this to us all along. You know, he said, bring the goats and bring the sheep. Sheep. Thank you. <laughs> sheep. Uh, Bring the sheep, just so you can realize that it's not about the goats and it's not about the sheep. Let me give you an example of this. All right, when I was uh, first learning to ride a bike, I was riding my bike, and my dad took the train wheels off, and you know, you know how your dad does—he grabs the seat of the bike and runs behind you, and then lets you go. And and, and he did this a couple of times, and I, and I had no problem with it. He let go one time, and I ran straight into a tree. Boom! <laughs> and I said. Let me go, man. <laughs> and my dad was like, yeah, well, you were doing so great. And I said, I don't like that. You know, and so dad says, all right, well, this is what I'll do. I'm going to tie a string. You know one of those little kite strings, you know? He tied a string to the back of my seat. And he says, I'm going to hold you up with the string. Right? And so then he backs up way away from me, right, you know, with the string. And he runs behind my bike with the string. He's like, I can do like this. I got you. I'm holding you up. And I was, felt so good about that. Riding my bike all around. And then dad said, well, okay, I'm done holding the string. He's like, oh, what am, when I fall down? And he says, okay, well, we'll wrap the string around the bike seat. And that's what we did, you know, the little bar that holds the seat up. So we went, wrapped the string around the bike, and I felt like the string is holding me up. You know, it's on the bike. I'm, you know, I'm five. I don't know any better. 
So I'm riding around on my bike with the string wrapped around my bike. Uh, now, is the string holding me up? Is it making me feel good about having a string on my bike? All right, so a little while later, we're working on my bike and the string is frayed and falling down. And my dad says, we got to cut the string off because it's going to get wrapped up in your bike chain. And I'm like, no, I'll fall down. And dad says, no, you won't because it's not holding you up. It's just, it was just there to make you feel better. And I said, oh, <laughs> okay. So he cut it off and I can ride a bike just fine. I don't need a string, even sometimes I, though I want one. Uh, but the, the point of that story is such a sacrifice in the Old Testament. Sacrifice was just a string so that we could feel like we were being held up by a God who already loved us, who would already forgive us. I was just waiting for the opportunity to send the sun in order to make it right. Does that make sense? So. I just forgot my code. Um, so anyway, what I think happens is that worship, when we're doing it right, it conforms us into the image of God. And what does that mean? Well, this... this worship series is based on a book by a guy named Brian McLaren called uh, Naked Spirituality. And in that, he talks about a study. And this blew my mind when I, when I read this. They did a study that said, and, and what they found, and they, they talked about uh, people of faith and praying and worshipers, right? And what the study found, that when a person contemplates and worships a God that they imagine as loving and forgiving, what happens is that it strengthens the portions of the brain called the frontal lobe and the interior cingulate. Is that right? Is that a doctor in the house? Is that okay. Um, and the interior cing cingulate. And what happens is that they have found that people who do that, their empathy and their, um, their ability to reason increases. That's amazing, right? So your empathy is your ability to relate to people who are suffering. So if you worship a God that you believe is loving, and forgiving, then you are able to, it, it changes your brain and you're able to, to empathize with people more. Now, when a person contemplates a wor and worships a God that they imagine as more wrathful and angry, it strengthens the limbic system in your brain, which is where we get our uh, source of anger and fear. Now, what the study basically said, and this is kind of how Brian McLaren wrapped it up, he says the act of worship creates a place within us for that particular God that we are worshiping, whether or not that God exists or not. Does that make sense? That you're creating a place for God, whatever God you're worshiping, whether that God is real or not. So if, if worship changes us, if, we're, if it's possible to be recreated into the image of God, what kind of God are we worshiping? What are we being changed into the image of? And I go to 1 John and I say that God is love. And if we're to be changed into the image of God, if we're to worship and draw closer to who God wants us to be, then I would say that, that with one word comes love. So, going back to Romans. What Romans is, is a book that theologians debate for hours. We, we love to do that. We love to argue with each other and, and, and spit little barbs of scripture to each other about Romans. Because in Romans, Paul sets up most of what we believe about our faith. Right? And there are all these little things in there. Well, what did Paul really mean when he said this? And what did Paul really mean when he said that? And, and it's, very, it's very heady. Um, and I am just so amazed, and I love this piece of scripture because towards the end of this book, after all of this, do this and not that, be this and not that, Paul just stops and he says, Oh, the depth and riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. In the middle of this letter on how to be the church, surrounded by a society that is not Christian because it's Rome, Paul just bumps into awe in a sense of, oh, and he says, all right, stop. Stop, 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 stop. Let's just worship. 
Let's just worship God right now for a minute. He throws up his hands and he says, you know what? I don't get all this stuff either. But let me tell you what's the most important thing. It's the worship. And this is how we worship. We present our bodies as a living sacrifice. That every day is a day and an act of worship. And then worship becomes a way of life. So in your waking, and in your sleeping, and you're going about your day-to-day -day life, the goal is to bump up to the awe. The goal is to bump up to the O. Oh. The goal is to worship God in every sense of the word. And in doing that, in doing that, we find ourselves changed. We become better people. We organize our lives a little bit better. Our days are no longer just this, you know, time to make the donuts. Right? You ever get out of bed and you feel that way? It's time to go to work. Time to make the donuts. Lord, put me anywhere else but where I gotta go now. You know? Now if your if your life, if your work is worship, do you feel the same way? What if you got out of bed and the first thing you said was, I am not in control. I don't like this job, but I'm going to it. But you know what? That's okay. Oh, I long to worship God today. And that's the first thing you think about when you roll yourself out of the bed. Do you think that will change your day a little bit? What if you bump up into a, bump into a friend at a coffee shop that you haven't seen in a while because they really made you mad? <laughs> and you're like, mm -hmm. And then there's that uncomfortable silent part, right? You're like, hey, <laughs> you know? What if, instead of being uncomfortable, and you said, you know, this day is for worship, and you said that in your head, or you said it with that friend, if the, if the problem was big enough, you say, I'm not in control, and that's okay. Oh, I long to worship God. And then you worship by having a conversation with someone that you need to make amends with. What if... Your kids just get on your nerves, whether they're being this big or this big, however old your kids might be, and they're just getting on your nerves, and you're like, ah, I'm not in control, <laughs> and that's okay. Oh, I long to worship God. And in that moment, you set them free. That's what a life of sacrifice is. <clears throat> Is like what you're doing is you're creating a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're creating a place within your own body that, that God can rest and live in. You're creating a sanctuary that God's essence can be safe in. And then others can be safe in you too. Others can be safe in trusting in you and being in relationship with you and knowing you. Because your body is a temple built to glorify God. It's not easy. I'm not going to say it is. I fail at it on a daily basis. But what it is, is it's worth it. So, as we close this, as we think about laying bare our souls to take up ways in which we can be purposefully worshipful, as we draw near to God who calls us to awfulness, <laughs> to stop and enjoy the splendor that God has to offer day in and day out, as we want and desire to make our bodies living sacrifices, as we strive to be sanctuaries for God, let us say this prayer together. I am not in control. And it's okay. Oh, I long to worship God. And let me add this to it. You don't have to say this one on a daily basis, but. And I long to be a sanctuary. 
Amém.